The text this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. These are the words of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray together. God of all life, we pray that your word today would help us to understand this life. We know also that we cannot understand it without experiencing it. And so we pray for your spirit of life to move in our midst, quickening and reviving us. We ask in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus was not an odd event an odd circumstance in an otherwise unchanged world. It is not as though the world is the kind of place where this this sort of thing never happens except for once. This was the kind of world where this sort of thing never happens until it started happening with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus came back from the dead, it was not as a resuscitation, as happened with Lazarus, but as a true resurrection. And as the Bible plainly teaches, when a man comes back from the dead that way, he pulls the whole dead world after him, and he pulls the dead world into life with him. The Lord Jesus was crucified on the cross, descended into the grave, descended to Hades, and came back from the dead, and he went down into the depths of Hades and grabbed the world and pulled it out, turning it inside out. The resurrection was the introduction of an irrevocable principle into a dead world. And there's not a single thing that this dead world can do about it except wait for the coming life. Life is coming. Life is contagious. Life is inexorable. And Jesus is the one who established that principle when he came back from the dead 2,000 years ago. In our text, we are told what happens when a man is in Christ. When a man is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. Notice that that Jesus coming back from the dead is a principle that establishes life for everyone who comes after him. The person in Christ becomes a new creature. It's not that the world is dead and Jesus uh, descends into it and he comes back from the dead and he is a new creation. Rather, he is a new creation in such a way as to enable all of us to become new creatures in him. Everything old passes away, and everything becomes new in and through him. Verse 17, this is what happens to any man who is in Christ. But how extensive is this phenomenon? The answer is global in scope. All things are of God, who has reconciled the church to himself already. The church is the body of people who are already reconciled to him. And he has given to the church the ministry of reconciliation for everyone else, to everyone else. In other words, we have been, we have followed Christ into life and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation so that we may tell everyone else to whom this life has not yet come, that the life is coming and the life is coming to them. So the message is broadening, and it is enormous in scope, as we see in verse 18. What is the heart of that ministry of reconciliation? Paul lays it out. God was in Christ, he says. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the world's sin to it. And as a result, committing the ministry of reconciliation to us. Paul says that God was in Christ, and God was in Christ doing something. God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, and God was in Christ not imputing, not reckoning, not counting the world's sins, the world's trespasses against it. Notice that. God was not counting the world's trespasses against it. 
This is why we're able to make an invitation. This is why we're able to issue an invitation to the whole world. So as a consequence, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God himself were speaking through us in verse 20. We therefore implore everyone, be reconciled to God. This is all based on a glorious and unbelievable exchange, verse 21. But even though the transaction is unbelievable, we are, we are called precisely to summon the world to believe it. Here is the unbelievable good news. What should I do with this unbelievable good news? Our reply is believe. This is unspeakable. What are we called to do? Speak it. This is ungraspable. What are we called to do? Paul says in Ephesians. He prays that the Ephesians would grasp the ungraspable. This is something that has already been done. This is not something that we are trying to get done. This is not something we are attempting to do. We are here because it has been done. We are here because he rose, not because we would like him to rise. We are here because he rose. As we think about the task of evangelism, as we think about the task of declaring the good news, as we think about what it means to provide a gospel presence in a dead world, it is crucial that we get our mission straight in our heads before charging off to fulfill it. Alacrity in, ob in obedience is no virtue if you've gotten your task all muddled in your head. Jesus didn't go out there and it didn't say, go out there and, and blunder in my name. He didn't say, get it all backwards. He didn't say, get it upside down. He wants us to get the message straight. He wants us to get the message clear. He wants the gospel straight in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. And then he wants us to go out and declare it. And we're not going to declare it. We're not going to declare it unless we get it straight because we're going to turn it into something that the, the, that the hearer must do instead of declaring it as something that God has done. So here's the issue. We are heralds announcing a salvation for the world that has already been accomplished. We are heralds announcing that the salvation has been accomplished. There are certain things that the people, uh, the people out there in the world must do because it has been accomplished, but one of the things they don't have to do, and indeed one of the things that they must not do, is try to install what has already been installed. They must, try not, they must not try to enthrone the one who is enthroned. They must not try to help Jesus ascend to the right hand of God the Father. He already has done this. Another way of putting this is that we are heralds, not campaigners. We are heralds, not campaigners. We are declaring that Jesus has been enthroned 2,000 years now. We are not canvassing for votes to get him elected. This is the declaration of a monarch seated in heaven. This is not a presidential campaign. We are not manning the phone banks on election night. Jesus has been wearing his crown for a long time. We are not telling the world that they ought to give Jesus a try. We are not telling the world that they ought to make Jesus their ruler and, and see what he could do if he's ruling over us. He is ruling over us. He is established in heaven. He is the governor of this world. Our message is that X has been done, and so we summon people to Y. X has been done, and so you must behave in a way that's consistent with that. It has been done, X has been done, we summon you to Y. It is not, and this is where many evangelical Christians, I think, miss in the declaration. It is not that X is desirable, and so we invite you to join us in making X a reality. We are not saying X is desirable, therefore why don't you join with us in making it a reality. We are saying it has been done, we are declaring it, he rose from the dead. There's nothing you can do about it. He has conquered death. That's an accomplished fact. Now, the one thing you may do is you may live in accordance with that declaration. You may reckon it to be so. God has declared it to be so. You may consider it to be so in your own life. The gospel is good news. The word for gospel is euangelion, literally good message, good news. 
It is not good advice. It is not a good platform. It is not a good idea. The gospel is not a good idea. The gospel is good news. The gospel is not a, pla- a good platform which would transform everything if we, if we would only try it. It's not a good platform. It is a, it is a message of good news, accomplished news, done, completed, once for all. Now, what do we, how, how, if this is the case, how do we interact with the world? How, how, how do we approach them? Paul says, Paul tells us in this passage. He says, if any man is in Christ, if any man, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. We are then told by implication that all things are new, which is to say that God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ. And that he is able to do this because God himself was in Christ. Notice, if any man is in Christ, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. And then it says, God himself was in Christ doing something. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And God himself was in Christ accomplishing this. Nothing can be the same. Nothing is the same. We have no authority to consider any event outside of Christ. Everything is related to Jesus. Everything is related to the death, burial, and resurrection. There's not one square inch of this cosmos that is outside the reach of that gospel message. Jesus Christ was crucified for for our sins, for the world's sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead in full accordance with the scripture, and he rose to, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. And when he ascended to God, the right hand of God the Father, God gave all the nations of the earth to him, entrusted all of them to him, as it says in the Psalms. Uh, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Jesus, in fact, asked for that inheritance. Jesus purchased the nations with his own blood, and then he ascended into heaven, and he said to God the Father, I purchased them, I want them. And the Father said, that's why I sent you into the world, to purchase them, and to want them, and to receive them. That's what God is doing. That's what, that's what this message is all about. It's not a good idea. It is good news. Not good advice. It is good news. This includes everything. You say, but how can this be? I, I, re, I, I look at the news. I, I watch the evening news. I, I look at my news uh, Sources on the web, and I, all I see is bad, you know, bad things happening, terrible things happening, things falling apart. I, I see people sinning. I, I see people doing bad things. God was in Christ, not counting the world's trespasses against them. God was in Christ dealing with that. There is not one thing that you have seen the world do. There's not one thing that you've seen non-believers do. There's not one thing that you've seen professing Christians do who are being disobedient. You've not seen one thing that human beings do that has not been addressed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That gospel applies. That gospel fits. That gospel deals with it. Now, the key for us is... Uh, I'm going to hopefully address this later, but unbelievers are going to start to believe this when believers start to believe it. Unbelievers are going to start to believe this when believers start to believe it. And when we start to believe it, we're going to begin to implore those who are not yet in Christ through faith in a way that does not drag us into their unbelief. We need to implore unbelievers to come into Christ. Now, we don't implore them to come into Christ because they have successfully carved out a space in the world that is somehow out from under the authority of Jesus. Remember, Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again from the dead in such a way as to encompass all things. So what we are doing is we are telling non-believers to make their peace with the way that the world now is. We are not telling them to join, join with our movement so that we can make the world the way we would like it to be. So this is how we implore them. The sun is up. The sun is risen. This is how Paul says it in Ephesians. Rise, O sleeper, and Christ will shine upon you. The sun is up. Christ is the sun in the sky. Evangelism 
is us going, going down into coal cellars, impl- imploring those who are living in coal cellars with blankets over their heads and their eyes shut. We're telling them to come out, take the blanket off, come up, up these stairs, come outside and, and lift your face to the sky. The sun is up. We are, we are not telling them, we must never beg them to come out of their coal cellar so that the sun might come up. We are not telling them to come out of their darkness so that we might live in the light. No, we are in the light already. We're the ones who understand the way the world is. Christians are the new humanity. We are established as the new humanity. We are the ones who recognize that the sun is up, and the sun is, in fact, up. There are people hiding under beds wanting to deny that. There are people hiding, tucked away in dark closets, wanting to deny that. Evangelism is the task of summoning people in the name of Jesus, imploring them in the name of Jesus to open their eyes, come out in the sunlight, lift your face to the sky. And notice that that is just the sort of thing, if you take my metaphor, if you take the illustration of some, some person who was terrified and upset and paranoid and he was, he was hiding in the basement under a blanket in the darkness, insisting on living in the darkness, and he, and he says the world is so terrible that it's, all, it's nothing but darkness, nothing, nothing but meaninglessness, nothing tastes, nothing coheres, nothing makes sense. If you found someone in the basement trembling, a fearful, upset, disoriented because he didn't believe the sun was up, and you knew that the sun was up, and you knew that all he had to do is come with you out into the sunlight, lift up his face to the sky, there it is. How would you, how would you talk to such a person? You would implore them. You would know how senseless it is to, to remain where they are. It's senseless. It makes no sense. It's tragic. It's sad. But we don't, we don't implore them because if they don't, uh, we, we don't implore them so that they will finally come around and make our program a reality. It's not a program. It's a kingdom. And it's a kingdom with an already enthroned king. It is a, it is a kingdom with a risen king. And as a risen king, he can never be assassinated. He can never die again. Death no more has dominion over him. One other thing has to be said in this regard. Paul says here that God is making his appeal through us. And note that this is not supposed to be a lackluster appeal. We implore, we beg, we plead, we beseech non-believers to come to Christ. And we do not do this because we are frail, emotional humans, and we have run out ahead of the divine decrees of God, the taciturn decrees of God. It's not like God is up in the sky as a cosmic infinite formula and he issues these decrees and and he looks down at the world and we're all but a bunch of ants scurrying around and he doesn't really care. No, it's not. And, and then, of course, the ants care about the other ants and so we plead and implore and that sort of thing. No, the God who decrees the end from the beginning, the God who knows everlasting to everlasting, the God who numbers all the hairs of your head, the God apart from whom not a sparrow falls to the ground, the God who is sovereign over all is in us when we plead. He is in us when we implore. He is in us when we beseech people to come to him. When we plead, God pleads. When we plead, God pleads. And when we refuse to plead, we are saying God is refusing to plead. When we refuse to reach out to someone, we are saying that God doesn't really care. Because whenever we reach out, whenever we share the gospel, whenever we beseech someone, the sun is up, come look, come, come and see. It's, sun, it's light out here. Whenever we do that, God is in us doing that with us. And we might say, well, I, don't, I can't get that to work out theologically. How can the God who decreed all things from the beginning, before the world was created, God decreed how human history was going to go. How can he step down into human history and plead with us? Well, God was in Christ, remember? God was in Christ when Christ bled. Why would God not be in Christ when Christ wept? Well, how would God be in Christ when he bled and not be in Christ when he wept? God was in Christ shedding tears over Jerusalem. Why can he not shed tears over a world that he's already purchased? He has already purchased the world. And when, we, when that truth gets a hold of us and we speak, 
as the psalmist says, I believe, therefore I have spoken. When we speak, God is in us speaking the same way. Why will you die, O house of Israel? The world is alive. We say, we say to the non-believer, the world is alive. There's no point in you staying dead. The world is quickened. There's, there's no point in you remaining here. Do you want to be the last one in the graveyard? Come, come, come out. The Lord Jesus is, did not come back from the dead in order to show us his power in the abstract. The Lord Jesus came back from the dead in order to transform human history, and he will not be content until human history is fully and completely transformed. It says in Isaiah 53 that he, the suffering servant, he will see the desire of his soul and be satisfied. He will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. The Lord Jesus will see what he has purchased and he will be grateful. He will see what he has purchased and he will be content. All the nations will stream to him because that's what he bought. So, what has God done for the world? What has God done for the world? What has God already done for the world? It says here in our passage that he has reconciled the world to himself. He has reconciled the world to himself. Now, do you see the vast difference? I hope you see the vast difference between Christians trying to talk a world that doesn't want to go into being reconciled with God and talking a wor- telling a world that has been reconciled to God that they might as well act like it. You are under arrest. You might as well come quietly. This is done. Come. It's accomplished. Come. The difference is whether or not the believers who are declaring the gospel believe what they are saying. One of the reasons why our evangelism, our evangelism tends to be impotent is because the non-believers are reflecting our unbelief back at us. We don't really believe what we're talking about. And so the non-believers pick up on that. We think, we, we say to them implicitly, by word, gesture, uh, grimace, whatever, you know, this is what, and nothing that I'm, I'm telling you is going to be true unless you vote for Jesus, unless you make it true, unless you come on board. It's going to remain untrue. And they say, well, I'm an unbeliever. I think I'll, I think I'll make it, continue to make it untrue. I don't believe. You don't really believe. So why should, why should I come with you? It says in our passage that God has reconciled the world to himself. It says, second, that he is not imputing their trespasses to them. What sort of trespasses are we capable of? What are we capable of as a, as a race, as a, as a planet, as a world? What do we do? Well, we have abortion on demand. We have homosexual marriage, we have genocides, we have wars, we have hatreds, we have racial enmity. We are a piece of work. We fill up the world with our sin. And if you look at the condition of the pagan world when Jesus came, when Jesus came, there were a lot of things that we do still and are ashamed of because of a Christian presence in the world. We we do and are ashamed of because of a Christian residual conscience in our culture. But there are many things that the pagan world, the pagan world that Jesus came to save was a world that gloried in many of these things. They celebrated many of these things. They honored these things. And God says, in effect, I am going to reconcile that world to myself and those sins, those murders, those adulteries, those abortions, those lies, those backstabbings, those treacheries, those embezzlements, all of those things that men do. In Jesus Christ, I'm not going to impute their trespasses against them. God, in Christ, is letting it all go. Now, how can God remain holy and do that? See, many, many non-believers like to catch at little phrases. They, they like to, how can a loving God send anybody, anybody to hell? That's a common objection. How can a loving God send anybody to hell? That's not the problem. That's easy, right? Sending people like us to hell is easy. Nothing has to happen for that to happen. 
Nothing has to be done in order for that to be possible. The real problem is how can a just and a holy God let any of us into heaven? That's the theological problem. How can God let us, how can God let the likes of us into his presence? In order to answer that question, God had to become a man and be flayed, crucified, crown of thorns, crown of thorns jammed on his head, spat upon, beard plucked out. In order to answer that question, how you can be in God's presence, in order to resolve that, Jesus had to die. And when Jesus died and then rose, he rose in such a way as to bring you, as to bring us. And then when, when God brings you and then God brings us and we all are brought, we, we all follow after the Lord Jesus and we come into salvation life, God does not say, okay, the last one in this column, slam the door and lock it. That's not what we're told to do. We are the first fruits. We're just the beginning of what God's doing. We are the beginning of God's purpose in human history. And we are told, just as Jesus brought us after him, we are told, we are commanded to implore the world, beseech the world, come, 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 come and see, come and taste. So God has reconciled the world to himself, already done. God has paid for the sins of the world, already done. And it says, undergirding this, that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. This ministry of reconciliation is entrusted to us. But since that word has been given to us, since that ministry of reconciliation has been entrusted to us, we have to be careful to be faithful to it. And the most common way to be unfaithful to it, the ministry of reconciliation, the most common way for us to be unfaithful to the ministry of reconciliation that we have been given, is to act like it has not yet happened. That's the common way of being unfaithful to it. The, the, the message is done, complete, over. God has settled it. Nothing else has to be done. No sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice animals. We don't have to scapegoat anybody. We don't have to have a war with anybody, making them into the, so they can be the orcs and we can be the elves. And we, we don't have to do that. We don't have to kill anybody. What we need to do is declare that someone has been killed. In Christ, we were raised to life again. In Christ, the church was raised to life. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. In Christ, we plead with that reconciled world to be reconciled. We plead with a reconciled world to be reconciled. Now, someone's going to say, well, suppose an individual, suppose someone out there refuses to be reconciled. Are they lost? Are you, are you, you're talking as though everybody goes to heaven. No, damnation is a very real thing. The Bible teaches very clearly. It's possible, it's possible to be lost. It's possible for an individual to be lost. It is not possible for the world to be lost. Why? Because Jesus died for the world. It is not possible for the world to be lost. It is possible for someone to refuse to come, to come with us as God is fashioning and creating a new world. That's possible. It's possible for someone to re remain with the old world. It's possible for someone to remain in their darkness. But we must invite them into the new world that has already been established, that has already been created. Now, there's no reconciliation apart from resurrection. There's no reconciliation apart from resurrection. And this is why we declare that in principle, the world is a world of resurrection. The world is a resurrected world. We are preaching the resurrection of the world through and in the resurrection of Jesus. So this is the glorious pattern in the, in the Bible. You see this over and over of the indicative and the corresponding imperative. The indicative, a simple statement of fact, and then the imperative. In the Bible, the imperative is always resting on the back of the indicative. The indicative statement is the declaration of what has been done, and then we are summoned to do something that takes into account what has been done. You don't say, if I, if I were to say the, um, the door is open, that's an indicative statement. If I said the door is open and someone responded, yes, right away and went to open it, 
that, that betrays nothing but confusion. If I say the door is open and someone says, yes, I'll open it right away, that is fundamental com- confusion. I might say the door is open, that's indicative, therefore you should act as though it's open. You should receive the fact that it's open. You should accept the fact that it's open. You should go through it. The door is open. Go through it. That imperative, go through it, that's consistent with the indicative statement. The door is open, therefore go through it. Jesus Christ reconciled the world to himself, therefore you believe. Therefore you go through the door. Jesus is the door. He has opened the way. Go through the door. That makes sense. You have been reconciled, therefore be reconciled. Do you see that Paul is saying there's a fundamental sense in which the reconciliation has already happened, and he says when, you, when you're pleading with someone to be reconciled, there's a sense in which they are not yet reconciled. They are not yet reconciled, but they should be, and they're invited to act as though they are reconciled. Believe it. Accept it. You don't have to do. You don't, the, this, the gospel is not a ladder that we prop up against the walls of heaven, and we offer to hold it while you try to climb up it and try to get into heaven. God has opened a way in Christ Jesus. You have been reconciled, therefore be ye reconciled. This has been done, therefore believe that it has been done. Christ is risen, let us act as though he is. Christ is enthroned, let us act as though he is. Christ is at the right hand of God the Father, let us sing as though he is. Unbelievers, as I said before, unbelievers will believe this when believers start to believe this. Unbelievers will come when believers start to come. Unbelievers will accept it when believers start to accept it. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, if the church, catches, if the church ever catches fire, the world will come to watch it burn. If the church catches fire, the world will come to watch it burn. What, will it, what causes the church to catch fire? Gospel fire, Holy Spirit fire, grace fire. All of this is what God does. If there's a reformation in the church, if there's a reformation and revival in the church, the world will take notice. But if we're just a, a specialty club, if we're a group of hobbyists whose hobby is to sing peculiar songs and meet on Sunday mornings, if we're sort, sort of the ecclesiastical equivalent of ham radio operators or, or quilting club, and we just, have, we just have strange tastes, that's all. If that's what we are, then why on earth would anybody want to join with us? But if God has established the new humanity in the true man, the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's what he has done, and we tell people that that's what he's done, and it is glaringly obvious to them that that is, in fact, what he has done, they are going to come. They are going to stream. The rod of Jesse will be set up, as Isaiah said, and the nations will stream to him. Great God in heaven, we thank you for making all things new. We thank you for including us in it. We thank you for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you for all things. We offer this prayer to you now, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father... The charge is this, remember that because Jesus has purchased the world with his own blood, there is no choice that anybody has to keep the world out of his possession. The world is his, he purchased it, he bought it. That does not mean there is no choice. A person can choose by rejecting Christ, a person can choose to to exile himself from the world, he can choose the outer darkness, but he cannot choose to have Jesus not be the king of this universe. Jesus is Lord forever and ever. I'd also like to thank you on a personal note for those of you who prayed for me during the service that I wouldn't make it a hat trick. (laughs) Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.